we're going to talk about keratitis here, and keratitis is one of the many disorders of the cornea. Uh, I divided keratitis, as far as infectious keratitis, which we're going to talk about here, from photokeratitis, uh, because photokeratitis is something different. It's caused from UV rays, whereas these forms of keratitis are infectious in nature, and they have a different pathology. So uh, photokeratitis is another disorder of the cornea, but we're going to talk about that separately. And then there's also corneal abrasion, which is very, very common, uh, and then some of these other corneal disorders that we'll talk about later. So the cornea is consistent with the sclera, which is the white of your eye, but the cornea is clear, and that's important because it covers the pupil and the iris, and you have to have something clear covering your pupil if you want light to adequately get into the eye and ultimately reach the retina, which is the goal of having the eye. So uh, the, the cornea is a multi-layered tissue and it covers the anterior chamber as well as the structures that are in the anterior chambers, uh, namely the iris uh, and the pupil uh, as well as the anterior ciliary body. Okay, so you don't need to be aware of how to read this or look at this. This is step one stuff, you've already done this. Uh, however, it's worth remembering uh, that the cornea has multiple different layers. This is stained, this is normally clear you wouldn't be able to see this. You can't see the cornea on a normal person. Uh, these five layers are the epithelium, and this epithelium is the outer layer, uh, and this provides your initial layer of protection. Uh, you have a stratified squamous epithelium here. Uh, this is the outer layer, and you have squamous cells at the most outer portion of the epithelium, and that transitions into more, a more columnar shape. Beneath the epithelium, you have Bauman's layer, which is a tough protective layer and also serves as basement membrane for the epithelium. You have a large stromal layer here. And then Decimet's membrane, which serves as a basement membrane for uh, the endothelium. And the endothelium has a pump function, and that pump function helps keep the sclera dry, which is uh, important. And then beneath that, then you have the anterior portion of your aqueous, aqueous chambers. Okay, so five important general principles before we start talking about the different forms of keratitis. Number one, keratitis is an infection of one or many layers of the cornea. Uh, so we're going to talk about one type of keratitis, uh, interstitial keratitis, which is only uh, an infection of one layer of the cornea, and that layer is the stroma. However, all the other keratitis, uh, they, can, uh, they usually start out on the outside and work their way ulcerating down inwards. So and they cause an ulcer, and that ulcer can be seen when you do a certain test, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Number two, the symptoms generally include at least redness, mild to moderate pain, photophobia, uh, mild change in vision, which is usually described as blurriness, as well as tearing. And this sets it apart from some of the other things uh, that causes uh, redness of the eye. So when you look at a patient, you see them uh, when you first encounter them, usually in the ED with keratitis, uh, the first thing that you're going to see is their red eye. And red eye has a large differential. So what are some of those things in that differential? First off, conjunctivitis. That would be the most common cause of red eye. However, with conjunctivitis, you don't have a change in vision. You won't have any blurriness. With keratitis, you do have a change in vision. And it's usually described as a mild blurriness. With anterior uveitis, uh, you'll usually have a, uh, a, a small pupil, a uh, meiosis. With keratitis, the pupil is normal. And then with acute angle closure glaucoma, you're going to have a very severe pain. The patient will rate it as the worst pain they've ever had in their eye. With keratitis, you may have a mild pain, but the patient will probably rate it as a 3, 4, or 5 out of 10. It's more of, a, of an annoyance, a foreign body sensation, an itchiness, but it's not the worst pain they've ever had before. And then there's other things that you see in acute angle closure glaucoma. Uh, you'll see an elevated intraocular pressure and then a fixed mid-dilated pupil. With keratitis, uh, there's abnormalities of the eye, but the pupil is not one of them. You should have a normally reacting pupil. Number three, patients who use contact lenses make up the bulk of the patients who present with keratitis. So it's important that you get this in their history uh, if you have a patient with red eyes. The question you should ask, one of the many questions you should ask, is do you wear contact lenses? If the answer to that question is yes, the probability of this being keratitis goes up. 
these patients are at very increased risk, uh, especially if they don't exercise proper hygiene in the handling of their lenses. They're also at increased risk because when they're putting the contact lens in, they are causing a slight trauma to uh, the epithelium, and that increases the risk of infection. And also, uh, the fact that they use uh, the contact lens solution that they use, that's just designed to hydrate the contact lens. It's not, it doesn't disinfect the lens. And so the lens can grow bacteria, fungus, or protozoa, uh, even though they may clean their contact lens with that solution, or purport to clean their lens with the solution. So in general, having contact lens uh, increases your risk of keratitis for many different reasons. And there's other things even further that you can do with contact lenses that uh, make it even worse. Like if you wear your contacts continuously, you never take them out, that certainly increases your risk. If you swim with your contact lenses in, that's going to increase your risk as well. Number four, uh, distinguishing the causative pathogen can be difficult. You're not going to necessarily know what the cause is just by looking at the patient's keratitis. Uh, so it's going to be important to, well, you're going to want to do two things. One, you're going to want to get a fluorescine stain on them, and then you look with a cobalt blue lamp or with a woods lamp, and that will help you de determine whether or not there's, uh, there's any kind of uh, ulceration there. Uh, or abrasion, I suppose, that's a differential. But uh, that's going to be one thing that's important to do. And then number two, it's going to be important to get a corneal scraping under anesthesia because with that scraping then you can, uh, you can use that to stain or uh, to culture and that's going to be useful to obtain the correct diagnosis. Number five, keratitis is vision threatening and so if you suspect keratitis, it can be very important to get early consultation with ophthalmology. And like I said, ophthalmology, they're going to be the ones who are going to uh, work most of this up. They're going to be the ones who determine the cause, uh, who manage the treatment. But this lecture is designed to give you a, an overall idea of what keratitis is, how it's treated, so that you have a good grasp on it, so that you don't sound like an idiot when you consult the ophthalmologist. Okay. So here's our five causes of infectious keratitis. We're going to start with the most common, which is bacterial keratitis. We'll also talk about HSV keratitis, which is another very common uh, uh, cause of keratitis. And then fungal, interstitial, and acanthamoeba keratitis. These ones are a little less common than the first two. Okay, bacterial keratitis is a rapidly progressive, and that is uh, unique to bacterial keratitis. That's very rapidly progressive, progresses within two to three days. Uh, very site-threatening infection of the cornea involving a bacterial pathogen. As mentioned, this is overall the most common form of keratitis. The pathogens here are strep, pseudomonas, uh, some of the gram-negative bacteria, and staph. So uh, I would say that strep and pseudomonas are probably the most common. And where do we find pseudomonas? We find it in water. And this is starting to come in why contact lenses are a big problem. Uh, as far as keratitis goes. Risk factors, LASIK surgery. So when you get LASIK surgery done, what are you doing? You're remolding the shape of uh, the cornea. And the cornea, when you remold the shape, you're causing trauma. Uh, so uh, LASIK surgery, one of the feared complications is bacterial keratitis, which ultimately leads to blindness in some cases. And so when a patient goes in for LASIK surgery, they, they're told there's a risk of blindness, there's a risk of something to go majorly wrong, Bacterial keratitis is towards the top of those reasons. Extended wear contact lens use for reasons uh, divulged earlier. The use of ophthalmic corticosteroids. Why? Corticosteroids inhibit uh, the immune system. And so using it topically will increase the risk of bacterial colonization. Uh, corneal injury, entropion, and chronic dry eye. So, uh, the symptoms of bacterial keratitis are, as mentioned earlier, uh, you're going to have conjunctival injection, that eye redness. That redness is slightly different than the redness that you see with conjunctivitis. With conjunctivitis, you have a very generalized redness, and it looks the same anywhere on the whites of the eye. With keratitis, the redness is generalized, but you see a very circumferential pattern. So 
the the most severe redness is going to be right around uh, the transition from sclera to uh, to cornea. So you can call this a, a circumcorneal conjunctival injection or a circumferential conjunctival injection. I'll show you pictures of that. Uh, of course, also you'll have mild changes in vision, pain, and photophobia. The cornea may be clear or it may be hazy. The haziness would be caused from uh, the infection. And then you may also note a hypopion. Hypopion would be a collection of pus in the uh, anterior chamber. And that would be uh, caused from extension into the anterior chamber, which can happen with keratitis. Uh, for diagnosis, uh, because you can't see damage to the cornea, you'll want to use a special dye, and that's called fluorescein. And fluorescein staining uh, is done to look for any kind of uh, ulceration or abrasion. Uh, and the thing that those two have in common is that they denude the epithelium. So if you were to apply fluorescein to a normal eye and then look at it under a cobalt blue lamp, you wouldn't see anything because the fluorescein would just wash right off of that squamous epithelium. However, if the squamous epithelium is denuded, if it's, if it's been scraped off, uh, either due to ulceration from an infectious cause or from a corneal abrasion, then the fluorescein is going to stick to Bauman's layer, that basement membrane, and you're going to be able to see the area where, where the uh, cornea is, is uh, damaged. And so I'll show you some pictures of this. Also, in addition for diagnosis, corneal scrapings should also be performed, and that's for staining and culture. The number one cause of keratitis is bacterial keratitis, but if you give the patient antibiotics and they don't recover, uh, they don't improve, then we're concerned about a different cause, possibly fungal keratitis, uh, possibly uh, uh, a, a acanthamoebic keratitis, and so we're going to want to do these cultures in advance so that we have them uh, as, as quickly as possible. So this is an example uh, of uh, an ulcer that you can see in bacterial keratitis. Uh, so this is uh, this area here where the fluorescein is is sticking is uh, the ulcer, and the, it, the, all we mean by ulcer is that the squamous epithelium has been denuded, denuded, and, uh, and so this is the fluorescein sticking to uh, that uh, basement membrane, that Bowman's layer. You have here this whiteness that might be a hypopion, but I can't tell for sure just by looking at it. And then you can see some, uh, let's see what might be some, uh, some haziness of the cornea. That uh, circumcorneal redness, if you note here, you kind of look around the cornea, you see that uh, there's increased redness, especially around, this isn't the best picture of it, uh, but uh, there's a particularly uh, increased amount of, uh, of uh, neovascularization uh, here, dilation of the vessels. Okay, and then this is a, another uh, bacterial keratitis. Here you just see the infiltrate and then the hypopion. So what do we do for management? Uh, we're going to, of course, first consult ophthalmology. Like I said, they're going to be the ones that primarily treat this. This lecture is just intended to give you an idea of what goes on and, uh, and how to, to point this out. Uh, corneal scraping should be sent for analysis, and then uh, the ophthalmologist will start them on broad-spectrum antibiotics, particularly that cover Pseudomonas. That's very important. And so uh, what's typically done now, and this is a change uh, from what was done uh, several years ago, uh, is that moxifloxacin is given uh, because moxifloxacin has very good penetration into the cornea, and it's also as one of those, uh, I think, fourth generation uh, fluoroquinolones. Uh, it also uh, it also uh, has good coverage for uh, pseudomonas. Uh, another regimen that can be used is uh, an alternation of tobramycin and cefazolin. Uh, another thing that can be done is a cycloplegic can be administered, and that's for pain. If uh, the uh, ciliary body becomes irritated, uh, you're going to get pain, and uh, so you can administer a cycloplegic to relax the ciliary body. And then uh, antibiotics are tapered uh, per ophthalmology, based on the clinical progression. 
Complications that can happen, of course, corneal thinning. Anytime you have an infection, it's going to damage uh, the tissue and it's going to take time for that tissue to build itself back up to normal, uh, to normal thickness. And so you can have corneal thinning that increases your risk for further infection as well as uh, for uh, perforation. And then perforation is the most feared complication. This typically leads to infection of the inner eye and this is generally going to destroy the eye itself. So herpes keratitis is the most frequent cause of corneal blindness in the U.S. Not the most common cause of keratitis, the most common cause of corneal caused blindness in the U.S. And it's the most common cause of infectious blindness in the world. Uh, this is typically caused by the, uh, the HSV-1 uh, herpes, so that's the non-STD herpes, but it can also be caused by the HSV-2 herpes through contact with genital lesions. Uh, herpes simplex 1 typically uh, will occur in the mucocutaneous distribution of the trigeminal nerve, and so in that manner it can cause keratitis. The symptoms here is going to be the same as for any keratitis, generalized but highly circumferential conjunctival injection, mild changes in vision, pain, photophobia, and so forth. Diagnosis same way you diagnose any keratitis. If you suspect keratitis, you should get fluorescein staining and uh, that will help you visualize any possible lesion. Now with HSV keratitis, this is the one that I want you to know how this appears because this may be a board question. I wouldn't expect it, but it may be a board question. Uh, the lesions associated with HSV keratitis most commonly present in a very characteristic way and that is in a dendritic pattern. And that dendritic pattern looks like little nerve cells, uh, like a tree. That's where the word dendritic comes from, dendros, Latin for, uh, or the Greek for, uh, for tree. So uh, in, in, most of the time when, the, when this presents, it'll be in a dendritic pattern. Uh, however, very early on, you may just note small vesicular ulcers, and very later on, you may note larger ulcers that kind of look more like what you would see in the bacterial keratitis. But the most common way for this to present is when it's in that dendritic stage. The presence of a dendritic lesion is an indication for treating for, uh, for herpes simplex. Uh, however, you should always get corneal scrapings for staining and culture. So this is a, uh, a fluorescein stain of a patient with early HSV keratitis. Uh, this is primarily what I was referring to as uh, those vesicular, uh, small vesicular uh, lesions. Uh, however, you might be able to see kind of uh, some early uh, dendritic uh, pattern in some of these ulcers. Uh, now, this is the dendritic pattern that I was referring to. And if you see this dendritic pattern when you do a, uh, a fluorescein stain, this is herpes, herpes, herpes. Uh, this doesn't appear anything else, uh, not in any of the other keratid uh, keratididies. So uh, definitely, I would definitely be aware of this. If you're going to take something out of this besides how to uh, your general uh, basic initial management of keratitis, I would take that out of this. If you're you're going to take anything out of these uh, these visuals visuals that I've put up. And then this looks more like a plaque. This is certainly HSV keratitis. You can see right here, you got that, uh, you got that uh, dendritic pattern down here, but then uh, you have also uh, have some placking up here. So this is later on in the course. And then this is definitely a plaque here. So much later on. How do we treat this? So of course, Number one, if you suspect keratitis and you get a positive fluorescein stain, you're going to consult ophthalmology. You want to get corneal scrapings and offer analysis. Uh, we're going to be treating the patient with topical, usually with systemic antivirals. However, that's going to be ultimately at the call of the ophthalmologist. Uh, so we're going to be targeting herpes simplex virus, so uh, orally we can use ganciclovir, famciclovir, aciclovir, and then the ophthalmic preparations are different. Um, I've never heard of topical aciclovir, it might exist, but uh, typically what's used are these drugs that uh, are probably never heard of before, and that's because they're only used with, uh, with uh, ocular herpes disease. So it only serves one purpose. And those drugs are trifluridine and vidarabine. There is one more uh, that I didn't list on here. 
just like any of the other uh, keratitis, uh, if there is pain, uh, it may be due to extension of inflammation to the ciliary body, which can cause ciliary spasm. Uh, and so you can offer cycloplegic for pain. You can also offer NSAIDs, etc. cetera. Uh, and then antibiotics may be offered if the diagnosis is uncertain. So let's say, for instance, uh, the patient presents like this, and you don't know, it might be HSV keratitis because the patient has a history of herpes, but at the same time, it looks like a plaque, so it might be bacterial. Uh, a lot of times with HSV keratitis, the ophthalmologist will also give prophylactic antibiotics even though they suspect it's herpes keratitis. Uh, so that's not the call of the ophthalmologist. You don't need to know uh, whether or not to do that. Complications uh, is corneal perforation. Uh, HSV keratitis tends to, as long as it's treated, have a uh, pretty good prognosis. Okay, interstitial keratitis. So this is kind of the uh, black sheep of the family. Uh, and this is a site-threatening but non-suppurative inflammation of uh, the stroma. And so up until now, and the next two we're going to talk about after this, these are all suppurative inflammations, or they cause, uh, they're, they're, they're inflammations that uh, cause a, uh, a inflammatory response throughout the uh, cornea. This, on the other hand, is non-suppurative, and it only affects the deep levels of the stroma. It's, it's restricted to the stroma. In the U.S., Interstitial keratitis is almost always the cause of syphilis, and particularly congenital syphilis. So this is an inflammation of the stroma, and it causes this, uh, this kind of haziness of the cornea, just like we see in all the other ones. However, as the disease progresses, there is neovascularization of the stroma, and that neovascularization, of course, vessels are red, and that redness mixed with the white, uh, the, the white uh, inflammation makes for like a pinkish color, and that's a salmon-colored corneal infiltrate. It's actually, uh, it's called the, uh, the salmon patch of Hutchinson. And if you remember back to congenital syphilis, you have Hutchinson teeth, and it's probably the same guy, I imagine, that named it. So the typical presentation of this is a, uh, a child, 6 to 12 years of age, with decreased vision, uh, and then this hazy or salmon-colored corneal infiltrate. They'll also have pain and photophobia and tearing, like in any keratitis. Typically, the condition starts unilaterally, so it only uh, present in one eye, but ultimately, down the road, either maybe a couple years down the road or a couple decades down the road, they will get infection of the other eye unless it's treated. So uh, the history and physical here is going to be really important. Uh, you want to know, does the patient have any other signs of congenital syphilis? That should be the first thing you think of if you are suspecting interstitial keratitis. Uh, so, uh, and usually it's going to be uh, the patient presents with these symptoms of keratitis and they have symptoms of congenital syphilis. Therefore, we are thinking this must be interstitial keratitis, but it can be worked through in many different ways. So does the patient have any other signs of congenital syphilis? Those can be things like Hutchinson teeth, saber shins, which is just an osteomalacia of the tibia. The shins will uh, protrude anteriorly. Saddle nose, that's kind of like if you were to take your nose and press it up, uh, upward. It kind of looks like that. I don't have any pictures on here of what a saddle nose looks like, but uh, you can Google it. Uh, developmental delay, usually cognitive deficits. Uh, deafness, and then seizure disorder. Those are all signs of congenital syphilis. You also want to know what was the patient's neonatal course. Did they have a rash? Did they have jaundice? Did they have hepatosplenomegaly? Those are all uh, early signs of congenital syphilis. And of course, was the mother known to be uh, infected? So this is interstitial keratitis. Uh, in this case, you don't see a whole lot of redness. Uh, but you do see a salmon-colored infiltrate. You might not be able to see it really well on the, the YouTube uh, format, but if you look in on this side, particularly of the infiltrate, you have a, a, a much more pinkish, orangish color. Another one. And then another thing that you will note, if you look up closely enough, usually through like a slit lamp, uh, you'll notice the neovascularization. And there's definitely neovascularization here, in addition to the infiltrate. So for diagnosis, you can do a fluorescein stain. And 
I mean, I would imagine that that would be a, uh, a, a logical thing to do anytime you suspect keratitis, but if it's performed, you will not note a defect. Why? Because this is not something that affects the epithelium. And in order for a fluorescein stain to be positive, to see an ulcer uh, or an abrasion, you have to have a, a, den a denudement of the squamous epithelium because that fluorescein is only going to stick to Bauman's layer. Uh, in, in this case, uh, with interstitial keratitis, you're only affecting the stroma. The squamous epithelium uh, uh, is totally fine. And so you will not note a defect with fluorescein stain, and that sets it apart from all of the other keratitis. Uh, diagnosis should be directed at the underlying etiology that you suspect, which, like I said, is usually syphilis. Uh, so you should get a VDRL. Uh, if the patient has a positive VDRL, it's worth noting that they should get a CSF analysis for neurosyphilis, which is going to require further management. Treatment is going to be management of the underlying cause. For syphilis, it's going to be penicillin. Uh, and then topical corticosteroids can be used here uh, to shorten the disease course once you're treating the underlying cause. Some other causes of interstitial keratitis, uh, certainly much less common than syphilis in the U.S. at least, would be TB, leprosy, Lyme's, uh, herpes simplex virus, mumps and measles, acanth amoeba, and then a lot of the tropical parasitic diseases. Uh, so those are... Uh, some of the things that you don't see in the U.S., like onchocerciasis, uh, uh, leishmaniasis, uh, trypanosoma, like that African sleeping disease. Uh, so those are not things you see in the U.S. <laughs> and then Kogan syndrome. Kogan syndrome is a unique one in that this is not necessarily infectious, uh, but it's autoimmune, uh, most likely. And this is a triad of interstitial keratitis as well as uh, the presence of an autoimmune vasculitis condition like Wagner's or uh, PAN, and then also vestibulo-auditory symptoms. So usually the patient will be deaf uh, and then have vertigo as well. Like I said, the exact pathogenesis is unknown, but this is, Kogan syndrome is a cause of interstitial keratitis. Okay, fungal keratitis is a, another site-threatening uh, infection of the cornea, in this case caused by any of a number of species of fungi, and this varies uh, widely based on uh, where you are and what your immune status is. The most common causes are Candida, Aspergillus, and Fusarium. Fusarium was actually linked to a relatively recent uh, contamination of contact lens solution. You need to maintain a high index of suspicion for fungal keratitis, especially in patients who you diagnose with bacterial keratitis, but they don't respond to broad-spectrum antibiotics. And this is a reason why we get those scrapings, so that if it happens to be fungal keratitis, then we know uh, sooner rather than later. Risk factors for fungal keratitis include trauma, contact lens use, topical steroid use, surface disease, immunodeficiency, pretty much the same risk factors as for bacterial keratitis. Symptoms here, same for any keratitis. Blurred vision, redness, tearing, pain or foreign body sensation, photophobia, possibly discharge, corneal infiltrate. For diagnosis, pretty much the same thing here. Fluorescein visualization should be performed. The ulcers are remarkably similar to bacterial keratitis. Uh, there's a few differences, but it's difficult to distinguish this from bacterial keratitis just on face value. Uh, the uh, lesions can be uh, a little less distinguishable. The, uh, they might have more fuzzy borders rather than really uh, uh, delineated borders. Uh, but other than that, it's, it's pretty difficult to uh, determine uh, the two apart from one another. Corneal scrapings, uh, again, like I mentioned, are going to be of the utmost importance for staining and culture. So here's just an example of fungal keratitis. This is affecting the, uh, the epithelium as well as uh, Bauman's layer and the stroma. So here's an infiltrate. Uh, this, here's an example, a, good, a better example of that uh, circumcorneal redness. You can see more towards the periphery, you have a little bit more white here, but there's much more redness coming in along the periphery of the cornea. So one of the differences from, uh, from conjunctivitis.
And again, you kind of can see it here too. A little bit whiter on the sides here, and then some redness around the cornea. And here's your uh, infiltrates here. A little bit different from your bacterial infiltrate. Don't worry about determining, just looking at the infiltrates. Uh, as far as USMLE is concerned, as far as practice is concerned, that's the ophthalmologist's job. The one I do want you to remember, though, is the herpes virus one. Okay, so differential. Uh, on finding a corneal ulcer, you should always consider the other causes of keratitis. So herpes should be considered, uh, especially in patient with prior herpes virus infections or previous diagnosis. Acanth amoeba keratitis, which we're going to talk about next, should be considered especially in patients with a history of contact lens use while swimming. And bacterial keratitis should be considered especially in patients with a rapid onset and progression. As far as treatment here, we're pretty much doing the same things as usual. Uh, Ophthalmology consult, get corneal scrapings, send for analysis. Topical and systemic antifungals are used here. Uh, orally, you can use amphotericin B. Ophthalmically, uh, natamycin is a common one that's used. And then uh, for pain, you can use cycloplegics, NSAIDs. And broad spectrum antibiotics are usually offered uh, depending on what the ophthalmologist determines. Uh, a, a big reason why you may want to use broad spectrum antibiotics is because of difficulty in differentiating fungal from bacterial keratitis. But another good reason is because about 20% of fungal uh, keratitis cases will develop a bacterial uh, superinfection. And so you don't want to have that co-infection along with the fungal keratitis. It'll just complicate things more. So a lot of times uh, the ophthalmologist will give both an uh, antifungal regimen and an antibiotic regimen. Complications include corneal perforation and bacterial co-infection, as mentioned. And uh, because of the difficulty in getting to the diagnosis, usually this will progress uh, before it's appropriately diagnosed. And so this is associated with severe visual loss in anywhere between 26 and 63 percent of patients. And finally, acanth amoeba keratitis. This is a rare uh, vision-threatening amoebic infection uh, seen most frequently in contact lens wearers, especially those who swim with their lenses in and fail to exercise adequate hygiene with lenses. So in a vignette, think of a 16-year-old who went swimming in a lake with their contact lenses in and a few days later has all the signs of keratitis or you're thinking it can't amoeba keratitis. Uh, so this has also been associated with contaminated contact lens solution and the risk factors is primarily contact lens use in 80% of patients. Uh, so only 20% of patients with it can't amoeba keratitis don't use contact lenses. The symptoms here are the same as any keratitis, the blurry vision, the redness, the foreign body sensation, photophobia, tearing, discharge, possibly corneal infiltrates may be seen. Uh, acanth amoeba infection can also cause anterior uveitis as well as hypopion if it extends to the anterior chamber and it can also cause scleritis. The symptoms here tend to be mild early on but without treatment it's going to progress to total visual loss and a lot of times this is not diagnosed until it's too late. Uh, the diagnosis here again you're going to do fluorescein staining, get corneal scrapings, uh, corneal biopsy can be useful if uh, the corneal scrapings don't show you any uh, useful results. So this is an example of acanth amoeba keratitis. Don't worry about how to tell this just by looking at it. The treatment here is uh, pretty much the same as usual, except uh, we want to focus on the acanth amoeba. So uh, the treatment, you will not get asked that on the USMLE. Uh, the reason is because the exact regimen that should be used is controversial and there's no broad consensus. However, uh, very commonly PO voriconazole or ketoconazole is used as well as uh, topical ophthalmic treatment. The complication is corneal uh, perforation as well as co-infection. And like I said, uh, this typically has a poor prognosis. Okay, finally, I just want to bring up a note here that a key differential for any corneal ulcer or keratitis 
is a corneal abrasion and vice versa. When you're thinking about a corneal abrasion, which is a really common thing to happen, that a patient may come into the clinic or into the ER, you also want to think of possibly keratitis. So what do these have in common? First, they look the same. Uh, in, uh, as far as they both cause a certain level of pain or foreign body sensation, they can cause blurry vision, photophobia, so we're thinking corneal ulcer or corneal abrasion. Also, if you stain the patient's eye with fluorescein, they're going to look pretty similar because even though with corneal ulcer it's affecting much, it's affecting much deeper. With a corneal abrasion, you've affected and you've you've abraded, abraded, for lack of a better word, enough of the epithelium off to where you're still going to get a positive fluorescein stain. All you need to do is denude off enough of the epithelium and you'll have a positive fluorescein stain, regardless of what caused it. So they look similar in those two ways. But how do we tell them apart? A corneal abrasion is associated with really recent mechanical trauma. So usually the patient will say something like, I was putting my contacts in and my fingernail slipped and uh, scratched my eye. Uh, a lot of times the patient will be able to relate this to you and this is typically the symptoms will come on within hours of the trauma and it's very very annoying to the patient and so if they come in they'll usually be able to recall when this came on. Uh, a corneal abrasion will never present with infiltrates so if they have any kind of haziness uh, in their eye you should definitely be thinking that this is likely a corneal ulcer. You can get corneal edema and that can look like an infiltrate but if you see an infiltrate, you should really be calling the ophthalmologist right away. And then a corneal abrasion will typically heal within 24 to 48 hours without any treatment. So if the patient has been having these symptoms for three, four days, it's not a corneal abrasion. And uh, regardless, even in abrasions, prophylactic antibiotics are typically administered. The reason for that is because you've denuded that protective layer of the cornea and so you're at risk for getting an infection. It's the same reason why prophylactic antibiotics are given out in, uh, in, uh, in late, after LASIK surgery. Uh, and if you're in doubt, you should always consult ophthalmology or just grab a colleague and get a second opinion. When my mom uh, was younger, when I was like three or four years old, uh, when my sister uh, was a baby, my sister scratched my mom's eye and I remember I had a glow-in-the-dark shirt, had glow-in-the-dark uh, writing on it and my mom had to get a, uh, a fluorescein stain and they turned the light on, uh, the woods lamp, and my shirt lit up. And so one of my very early memories was my mom getting a fluorescein stain because my sister scratched her eye. So I'm sure my sister would be thrilled that I disseminated that information. So if you have any questions, uh, feel free to get in touch with me. but. Please don't uh, bog yourself down with too much of the details of this. Just know the basics of keratitis.